final night of our Earth Week uh, speaker series. I'm very, uh, very excited to introduce our last speaker of the week. Um, his name is Peterson Toscano. He is a Bible scholar, uh, playwright, actor, and um, writer, also a climate advocate and social justice advocate. And he's here tonight joining us. He had been traveling all around the U.S. Uh, I had the pleasure of, of seeing Peterson and meeting and talking with him last year at the Citizens Climate Lobby Conference in Washington, D.C. Um, and it's a really, his, his message is very humorous and it's, it's full of storytelling and uh, bringing all these issues together, um, the social justice issues. Uh, and, and, you know, he's not an environmentalist, but he views climate change as a human rights issue and sort of brings it all together with his uh, religious aspect as well as... Uh, LGBTQ perspective. So, very excited to introduce Peterson Toscano for tonight's event. Thank you. This is not going to be your typical environmental talk uh, for a couple of reasons. One, uh, I'm an actor, I'm a character actor, so at different points during the presentation I will perform in character. So I will warn you so you're not like caught off guard about that. My friends, um, I've been doing performance art since 2003 and I've mostly focused on lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer issues. And I'm also a Bible scholar so I've done a lot of work around the Bible. And so my friends who followed my career for a long time, they're really kind of surprised that I'm invited to be an Earth Day speaker. You know, they're like, like are, you, are you sure? They, because I'm usually the pride speaker, right? Not the earth pride guy. And I said, no, it's, it's, it's okay. I said, although I'm not an environmentalist, I am concerned about climate change as an LGBTQ issue and as a faith issue, as a person of faith. And I see it as a justice issue, a Black Lives Matter issue, a women's rights issue. There's lots of reasons that I'm compelled to do stuff around climate that have actually not very little directly to do with environmental movements. And so tonight I'm going to mm, do this bizarre presentation that I call Everything is Connected, an evening of stories, most weird, many true. And in my career, I've, I've dealt with three completely different issues that in my head they all are connected. And to help you help organize these three, I'm going to do them in three acts. And then if I do my job right, I'll weave them together and at the end you'll say, oh yeah, they're all connected. Or like in a week or two weeks. <laughs> so, um, so I'll start with act one, which is called homo nomo. You see, I'm gay. And it used to be back in like 2003, if I said that in a lot of audiences, it was like really exotic and a little dangerous. But these days it's kind of boring, you know, like there's so many gay people out there, it's like big deal. But what is interesting about my story is for a lot of my life growing up, I didn't want to be gay. As a Christian, I felt that I could not be gay and Christian. So, um, you know, as human beings, we can do some pretty extraordinary things. And we can do some pretty extraordinarily stupid things. And at age 17, I decided, you know what? I don't want to be gay anymore. Um, not that I was very gay for very long, but I decided I'm not going to be gay. I'm going to be straight. I'll ask God to cure me. And I then began a journey, an odyssey, and I ended up spending the next 17 years and over $30,000 on three continents attempting and utterly failing to make myself a masculine heterosexual. My partner Glenn's really happy about that, personally. Um, but it was a, it's a weird story. Like when I tell people, like I spent almost 20 years of my life trying to make myself straight. They're like, what? What are you talking about? It's called conversion therapy. Anybody ever heard of conversion therapy? Yeah, and so I was involved in that for a long time and because I believed it was possible to change. And a lot of times people want to know, like, so what do they do? Like, what are the methods? How do they try to fix you? And there were, like, a lot of different methods, and some of them really weren't very effective. Like, so, for instance, uh, there was, like, weekly support groups that we would go to. And you're with a bunch of other guys struggling with their sexuality, talking about it, and then going off to pray afterwards. And, you know, you could see that it wasn't always the best strategy. Um, there was a lot. A lot of it, actually, was just kind of, like, basic, you know, Bible study and prayer, thinking that if I... Put, put enough of God inside of me, it would like push out the bad gay stuff. And then there were a couple of exorcisms. Um, you know, it happens eventually, even if it's not your church tradition. Someone will say, you know, you probably have some demons inside of you that need to be cast out. 
Um, I lived in New York City for 10 of those 17 years. And let me just say, New York City is not an easy place to not be gay. Like, even if you're not gay. I mean, it's... And so this one exorcism was actually in Brooklyn, New York, and was so loud that the neighbors called the police because they thought someone was being murdered. So I did some pretty wacky things to try to cure myself. And in order to face up to them, I have done a lot of comedy. Because I've discovered that comedy... Well, you could use comedy to make light of issues, you could use comedy to make fun of people, but you could also use comedy to shed light. So I, uh, I wrote a play back in 2003 called Doing Time in the Homo Nomo Halfway House. And it was about an experience I had in Memphis, Tennessee. I spent two years in a Christian residential program designed to make me straight. And I have to say, there's a lot I've learned about life from going to this gay rehab. And I thought, if you'd like, I can do um, a short excerpt from that play so you can kind of get a picture of what it was like inside this place. They didn't call it the Homo Nomo Halfway House. It was called Love in Action. We called it Homo Nomo. Uh, because you need humor. In hard times, you need humor. So um, are you interested in seeing a little scene? Do I have your consent? Yes, because yes, consent is really important. All right, so in the scene, you're going to meet two characters, um, Chad and Vlad. Little disclaimer, it will appear that one of the characters says uh, a cuss word. I know there might be people under the age of 18 in the room somewhere. Um, but through the magic of performance art, performance art, the word gets unsaid. It'll all make sense. All right, so two characters, Chad and Vlad. Here, um, everything you are about to see actually happened. It is really funny and disturbing. So if you laugh and feel uncomfortable, that's about right. Hi, and welcome to the Homo Nomo Halfway House. My name is Chad, and I will be your tour guide. The Homo Nomo Halfway House is a Christian residential 12-step program that helps men, oh, and women too, we don't discriminate, overcome our addictions to homosexuality and compulsive sexual behavior. It is an amazing program, and I thank God they took me in just in time. Now, before we go any further, we need to get something straight. Sorry, that's a little ex-gay humor around here. But no, seriously, here in the program, they never promised to make any of us actual heterosexuals. That would be a little ambitious for some of us. But they tell us that if we do our part and we work our programs, we're going to come out of here as healthy, celibate ex-gays. And I'm really excited about that. Okay, so before we go further in our tour, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about the rules of the house and how it operates. And to assist me with that is one of our newest participants, Vlad. Hey, Vlad, we're ready for you. Mm -hmm. Vlad is from the former Soviet Republic of Azger Bazaar. Bazan, I never say it right, but it is so exciting what the Lord has done, how he has torn down those horrible iron curtains and those people who lived for so many years under so much lies and oppression are now free to come to our country and be part of a program like this one. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. So here's Vlad. Hey, Vlad. So Vlad's going to tell you a little bit about the program and how it operates, and I'll add my writing commentary as I do. And don't be nervous, Vlad. They seem like a really friendly group this week, unlike last week when we were infiltrated by those GSA people. They're so intolerant. Hello, my name is Vlad. Like well, have been in this Homo Nomo Halfway House for 27 days. Here in Homo Nomo Halfway House, we have five phases. We do 12 steps, and there are approximately 275 rules. First, I tell you about phases. When we move from phase to phase, this is called a phase bump. Technically, only the staff is allowed to bump you. Now I tell you about the rules. Here in Homo Nomo Halfway House, we have many rules. The rules serve as boundaries, because in our former lives as practicing homosexuals, we have no boundaries. Now to me, all of the rules, they are important, of course, but probably the most important rule of all is, you must fuck us. <gasps> oh my gosh, what are you talking about? No, this is true. You say you must fuck us. You fuck us on the issues. You fuck us on the family. You fuck us. <laughs> Oh my gosh, no silly, we pronounce that word focus. It's just working on his English. Um, and you need to promise me that from now on, that's how you're going to say it. It's focus. Well, this is what I said. Fuck us. <laughs> now I tell you about the rules. Here in Homo Nomo, halfway else, you must shave. 
every day. And this includes women too. You must shave here, you must shave here, but you must not touch upside down triangle. Uh, ew, inappropriate, and we'll talk about it later. Ugh. And when we shave, we are forbidden to use any aftershave or cologne. Um, that's because of the sense memory of smell. You see, somebody could be wearing the scent of a former sexual partner, and that could trigger me. Just like that. So let me just say for my safety and yours, could you please stay in the back of the room if you're wearing Calvin Klein Obsession? <laughs> Here in Homo Nomo, halfway else, you cannot go to the movies, you cannot surf internet, you cannot have mobile phone, you cannot listen to music. Well, they do let us listen to contemporary Christian music. Praise the Lord. <laughs> well, in Homo Nomo, halfway house, you are forbidden to have sexual relations with anyone, including yourself. Well, in Homo Nomo, halfway house, you must report all FI behavior. FI stands for false image, because in our former lives as practicing homosexuals, we often hid behind the masks. Oh my gosh, that's so true, Vlad. We would plaster over our true God-given personalities with these false image masks. Mm, well, take me for instance, oh my gosh. Before I came into this program, I was so effeminate. No, seriously. No, I'm not joking. Um, no, and they've done wonders on me. I think a lot of it has to do with the weekly football clinics. It's really butched me up. <laughs> Well, there are tons more rules, and I'm sure they'll pop up as we go through our tour. They always do. But Vlad, before we go any further, I want to give you positive credit because throughout your entire presentation, you held your hands to your side and you maintained good eye contact, which is very healthy masculine behavior. But not for you ladies. It's a little aggressive coming from you. Okay. Let's give them a little round of applause, shall we? <laughs> and scene. Hmm. Hmm. All right, so that is just a sample, a sampler pack of the Homo Nomo Halfway House. I make fun of it because I tried to tell, early on I tried to tell my experience in a straight lecture and it was just so horrific. And I found the comedy can help show what was going on in that place. And it was ultimately a very oppressive place. It wasn't particularly friendly to women. Did you pick up on that? Not very female friendly, nor was it very femme friendly. I mean, part of it actually had nothing to do with my sexual desires. It had almost everything to do with gender. One time they, they often would split us up for gendered activities, like, you know, women, you go and have a Mary Kay makeover, you know, while the men, we um, learned how to change the oil in our cars. And I remember that day I called my dad, Pete Toscano, from the Bronx, uh, a U.S. Marine, always, you know, it's like once you're a Marine, you're always a Marine. I mean, that was, that was my dad's gender identity, a U.S. Marine. I mean, a very, a very sweet, very wonderful man. But I called him, I was all excited, and, and my parents never pushed me into this program, it was my idea. But I thought he'd be proud of me, so I called and I said, hey dad, guess what? In the program today, they taught us how to change oil in our cars. And my dad doesn't say anything for a while, then... He finally weighs in and he says, yeah, why do you do that? I just go to Jiffy Lube. I say, like, Dad, that's so gay. But it had a lot to do with gender, gender policing. Now, so people ask me, the question they ask a lot is, so, you know, what did you do in these programs? But to me, the question that's more important is, why did I do it? Why was I interested in changing my sexuality and why for so long? I mean, I could see doing it for, you know, a month or a year or even two years, but 17 years of one's life, that's a huge commitment. And I've been thinking about it. I've been working on a memoir called Waking Up from a Biblically Induced Coma. <laughs> and, um, and I've been reflecting on the time, the conditions that existed in America, the Petri dish that was going on that influenced me. And it was, um, you know, I was coming of age during the early 80s. It was the, you know, Ronald Reagan was president, Margaret Thatcher was prime minister. The country had gotten very conservative at that point. There were very conservative religious voices, the moral majority, Pat Robertson. You had focus on the family and James Dobson. And you would hear things regularly on the media about the homosexual threat. And, and so it, it was seen as homosexuals were outsiders, um, gay people, they would call us homosexuals then, and that we were a threat. And then, so there was that, that was there. On the playground, obviously, no one had anything good to say about gays, and from the pulpit, I heard a lot of negative messages. And so I'm putting all of this together, and I'm seeing, wow, nobody really likes anyone being gay, getting that message loud and clear. Then to make things a little bit more complicated, there was the introduction of a disease that started spreading, a disease, a disease called GRID, 
How many of you have ever heard of GRID before? It was the gay-related immune deficiency. Sometimes they called it gay cancer. They later renamed it to HIV AIDS, which I think you may have heard of. But at first, for the first few years, it was called GRID. And as a young teen, reading the papers, living outside of New York City and reading about this gay cancer, I was terrified. And I'm thinking, wait, nobody likes it if you're gay. You can die from it and go to hell. I'm going to do the math here. I'm not good at math, but I think I should not be gay. So that's what kind of got me in it. And, but another part is I'm, I'm a Christian. My faith is really important to me. And I was told you cannot be gay and Christian. So I was like, okay, well, I love God. I'll just get rid of that gay thing. And I tried it for 17 years. But the question that remains, though, but why did I do it for so long? I mean, sure, you get involved, but why so long? And I think part of it was I wanted to serve. I wanted to be somebody who traveled around the world sharing good news as a missionary. But I was disqualified from service, in part because I was seen as a Christian struggling with homosexuality, but also because I was seen as a feminized man. The men in the church, is the evangelical church I was part of, they didn't see me as a real man. They saw me as less than a man. So I began to experience the same problems the women had been experiencing for generations. The uh, inability to have access to places of power and privilege, I started to bump up against what I call the stained glass ceiling. And I have to say, when that happened to me, when I ran into that wall, it was shocking to me. Because as a white man raised in America, I was raised with the impression that every door opens eventually. You just knock enough, you smile, whatever, the door opens. But to run into a door that was slammed shut in my face, well, I felt the cabin pressure of power and privilege drop. And there was like this instinctual fear, I need to get that back. And, and it was so interesting, the many men in the churches, the straight men, who wanted me to get it back, too, and tried to help me at least appear more masculine. And so I'm not proud of the fact, but it really was uh, one of the things that kept me in there was I wanted to be stronger in the world. Because reality, I was a femme, gay, Roman Catholic, Italian-American, working class kid, desperately trying to become Ronald Reagan, with less wrinkles, of course. <laughs> Which brings us to Act Two. See, we're clipping right along. Act Two is called Transfiguration. So I came out gay. Well, first I came to my senses, and I came out gay after those 17 years. And my coming out wasn't like triumphant, like, woohoo, yay, I'm gay. It was more like, all right. It was like getting the, you know, a, a bad diagnosis. You've got the gay. It's not going away. You're going to have to learn how to live with it. And um, I had all these misconceptions about the LGBT community. Uh, I didn't know anything about it except lies that were told me. And I also had a, a, an idea that this, of all communities, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender people, this was the most inclusive of all communities. Everybody found a home. We were all these refugees, then we found a place. But it actually wasn't like that. I noticed right away that as I hung out with other gay men, um, th they had a funny way of talking about women. And, and, and women's body and lesbians that was really, uh, you know, just really negative. And, uh, and then I noticed also there was, there was a real, like, negative talk about people who are bisexual. People thought, oh, no, that doesn't really exist. And then I noticed um, a lot of overt racism among uh, white gay men, both when I was living in the South in Memphis, but also up north in Connecticut. It was sort of, you know, an epidemic, and they just assumed I was a white gay guy and I would go along with it. And um, I definitely noticed a lot of anti-femme sort of talk. In fact, the, the personal ads at that time, if you were looking for a mate, the personal ads at that time said something like, straight acting masculine gay man seeks the same. And I was new at this, right? And I'm thinking, okay, I know what masculine is, but what is a straight acting gay man? Like, do you have a wife and kids at home? Because that's straight. But no, they meant gender. They meant that if you're going to date me, you better be a butch masculine guy. I was like, hmm, this sounds very familiar to me. I've just been through a lot of gender policing. And then I was really shocked to see just how violent, verbally violent, um, people were in the LG community towards transgender people. 
And that kind of shocked me because, again, I thought we, you know, we're all in the same boat together. Why are we sniping at each other? And so, I mean, I, you know, I had my own prejudices and biases that I went in with. But when I saw this and I had already begun speaking out and telling my story, I thought, I have to take responsibility to talk to my own people to address some of these issues. So I did what anyone would do under the circumstances. I did Bible scholarship. I mean, right? I mean, right? That you're following these connections I'm making, right? I mean, you do Bible. I mean, for me, I do Bible scholarship because I'm a Bible scholar. And um, I asked a very important question at that time. At that time, it was people were like doing queer Bible stuff, but it was always like, who's gay in the Bible? Which kind of bored me. I was like, meh, whatever. I was more interested in this question. Who in the Bible transgresses and transcends gender? Who in the Bible breaks the rules of gender? Who rises above it? And I began to look at the Bible to see who breaks all the rules around gender. And I was shocked that there were so many gender non-conforming people in the Bible. So I wrote uh, a play, a performance lecture called Transfigurations, Transgressing Gender in the Bible. And it just came out literally this month as a film. And it's been getting a lot of attention, not all of it, very positive. Um, it was like on Glenn Beck's The Blaze site the other day. And they, uh, they seemed really interested in it, <laughs> really interested. And I thought um, I would show you a little sample of it. I have a trailer I'll, I'll show you. Um, Alex, I'm ready for you. I have a little trailer I can show you um, about the, the play uh, so you can kind of get a sense of what, what I do. But to me, it was really important to have people see that even in the Bible, the people that were being picked on in the world, the straight and the you know, LGBT world, that there were gender nonconforming people back then. So I'm going to hit the lights. Movie. Oh, wait. Uh, movie. Sorry, movie. Yeah, let me get the movie. You'll see. Okay. You'll see. Just hit play. Oh, you don't have the it's sound on. Oh, here you go. Indoors after so many days and nights out on the road. So I asked the question, who in the text is transgressing and transcending gender? We routed our enemy. Yes, I am a eunuch here in King Xerxes Jacobs and Joseph to go check on them. The word is actually a very short phrase. It's ketonet pasim. Jacob gave Joseph ketonet pasim. Thank you. So I thought I'd do a scene for you from Transfiguration so you can see how this works, how uh, there are gender nonconforming people in the Bible. I don't know, I've got a spotlight now and everything. No, okay. um, so I want to tell you the story, but I want to make sure that we all have sort of a basic biblical literacy. I don't want you know, people to feel like I'm lost. I don't know what's going on. So uh, I want to ask about some characters in the Bible. I know there are some people in this room that know these characters. So I'd love it if you could help the others by shouting out the answers so we all kind of have, are on the same page. So I want to tell the story about two brothers in the book of Genesis, which is the Hebrew Bible. Some people call it the Old Testament. And uh, they're brothers and they're twin brothers. I'm talking about Jacob and Esau. How many of you have heard of the names Jacob and Esau? All right, some basic knowledge here. All right, they're twins. Were they identical twins? You can speak louder. No, no, no they were not identical. So if we were going to do a play, Esau and Jacob, and I wanted somebody to play the part of, of Esau, the text, the, the story tells us a lot about this character and about his body. So what do we know about Esau's body? He's a hairy man. He's a hairy man. They go out of their way to say how hairy he is. So on a scale of one to 10, one being very hairy, where does he fall? 10 or an 11. He's a super hairy man. From, from smooth to hairy, he's really hairy. In fact, um, he's kind of more like a gorilla. At one point, his brother Jacob, who is very smooth, um, wanted to trick their blind father 
by pretending to be Esau. And, but he's like, but mom, I'm a smooth man. And he was. He was a very smooth man. They go out of their way to say he was very smooth. <laughs> and so the mother helped him get dressed up in Esau drag and got sheepskin and tied it to his arms and his chest. And he's like, now when you go to your father, if he touches you, he'll think that, you know, you're Esau. Because Esau was like a gorilla. Okay, Esau, we learn more about him. What was he really good at? What was him? What was the t hunting? Yeah, he was an incredible hunter. Uh, and what was his personality uh, and temperament like? Did he lead with his head, with his heart, or with his stomach? His stomach. Yeah, he kind of was like very, you know, sort of like would blow up a lot and he kind of like, feed me, I'm really hungry, I'll give you anything, even my birthright, I don't care. Jacob, on the other hand, was very smooth. He was like a naked mole rat, the way they describe him. Um, my gosh, it wasn't that long ago that that was the look, that men had to be really smooth in America. And I'm Italian-American. That was work, let me tell you. But I'm so glad that hair is back. You know, there are beards. I mean, we are in a glorious time of beer and, and hair. It's good. It's a good time in history. Um, so, um, yeah, he was very smooth. And uh, what was he good at? Anybody know what he was good at? Jacob? Cooking, yeah. He was a fabulous cook. Now it's important when we do this work that we don't impose our modern ideas of gender on these ancient stories. Um, so that's why it's important to know men today obviously can cook, not a problem. But back then, you did not see men cooking. This was a rare gender transgressive act. Um, it just didn't happen. In fact, the, the term they used to describe Jacob is he dwelt amongst the tents which was a euphemism for like he's always out there with the women because that's where the women were amongst the tents. So Jacob and Esau, uh, Jacob um, was, um, you know, had a couple of sexual partners as happened in the Bible and a bunch of children including a very famous son by the name of Joseph. You may know him by his amazing Technicolor dream coat. <laughs> any, any of you ever saw the musical Joseph and the amazing Technicolor dream coat? Yeah. Any of you were in it? Well, there's usually somebody. They always choose, like, I was in the choir. Um, yeah, so that's a very interesting story. Jo Joseph's a very compelling character to me and appears in Muslim, Christian, uh, Jewish traditions, and in pop culture. Lots of people know this story. Um, but there's something about his gender I find very interesting. Yes, he is male, but he's not like the other men. You know, just like I'm male, but I'm not like my father. I mean, we are both men, but we're gendered very differently. Uh, and I think that's what's interesting about gender. It has different shades of how it, how it projects itself. And there's actually a mystery in the story that you could only see if you're reading it in Hebrew. It doesn't get translated well. So um, I want to perform a scene from Transfigurations and include this mystery that's in the text. And, um, and then uh, I'll tell you a little bit about it afterwards. And I decide I, I want to tell the story from the perspective of Uncle Esau big, burly, hunter, Uncle Esau. So you ready for a little transfigurations? Yeah, I'm Esau. You probably know my brother, Jacob although we went and changed his name to Israel. We're twins, Jacob and me, although you never know it by looking at us. I mean, I'm a real man. I'm big, I'm hairy. I'm always out in the field doing real men's work, while my brother, he's as smooth as a woman. Very sensitive growing up. He liked to dwell amongst the tents with the women. They're cooking, they're gossiping, they're scheming. He was a real girly boy, and since I was normal, our father Isaac, well, he favored me. Now, don't get me wrong, although my brother was a girly boy, he liked the women, okay? In fact, he had two wives and slept with both their handmaidens. And from those women, he had a pack of children, daughters, sons, strong, strapping young men, all of them. Except for one of his youngest, Joseph. This kid, he was trouble from the day he was born, always crying, clinging to his mother, not wanting to go out into the field to do real men's work. And then when he got older, he began to have these dreams these crazy dreams that he told everybody about. Listen, boys are not supposed to dream. Well, one day I pulled my brother aside. I said, listen, you got to do something to this kid. Toughen him up. It's a rough world. They're just going to ride right over him. But does he listen to me? No. Indulges him. 
gives him everything he wants, including that robe. Listen, you wouldn't catch me dead in a robe like that. For one, too expensive for my taste. A royal garment, the kind of garment that a king gives to his virgin daughter. It was a princess dress. My brother Jacob gave his son Joseph a princess dress. That kid, he put that dress on. He flitted about the compound like he was some kind of butterfly. And I thought, this is not going to end well. Sure enough, one day when the boys were out in the field doing real men's work, Jacob sent Joseph to go check on them. And that kid, no sense in his head, he puts on the stupid dress, goes traipsing across the countryside, making fools out of all of us. Well, his brothers, they saw him from a distance. Who could miss him in that getup? And they said, enough of this dreamer. They rushed him. They threw him to the ground. They beat him black and blue, trying to beat some sense into him. Then they ripped off this stupid dress, tore it to pieces, defiled it in blood. They came back with the bloody garment and a story about how their brother was attacked by a wild beast. And that's all that remained. But later they pulled me aside. They told me what really happened, how they sold their brother to some traders going off to Egypt, sold him as a slave. And I thought, you know, maybe it's all for the best. I mean, listen, I'm a shepherd. I know if you got a weak lamb, you take it out. It's just going to bring the rest of them down. And besides, the kid might do okay for himself there in Egypt land where they go in for the whole girly boy thing. Well, years go by. I didn't give him a second thought. Who's got time to mourn? And then we had that drought, famine. It comes in cycles. You just got to be man enough to ride it out. But this time was different. It was like the earth was cursed against us. You couldn't scratch life out of the ground. It got so bad, we finally sent the boys to Egypt to get grain. Not to beg. We don't beg from anyone. And they were brought to some high official in Pharaoh's court. And at first, they couldn't tell what it was. A man or a woman with the, the headdress, the makeup, the flowing robes. Those Egyptians. Turns out, it was their very own brother, Joseph. Somehow, that girly boy worked his way up through the ranks to become second in command of the whole kingdom. Now this was Joseph's chance to get back at his brothers, to get his revenge. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, you don't let anyone ride over you. But does he? No. Not that girly boy. He goes off weeping like a woman and then he comes back to try to teach his brothers a lesson. Then he forgives them and he reconciles with them. He gives them food. He gives them shelter. He treats them like he's their sister or their mother, not like any man I've ever seen. And in so doing, that girly boy, my nephew, Joseph, he saved us all. Now, I don't know about you, but I find the story of Joseph and his brothers very moving. I always cry at some point, particularly when he reveals himself to the brothers. Um, and it's a story, a complicated story, um, where it's a big blended family. One dad, lots of moms, lots of half-brothers, half-sisters. And um, it's a story about inheritance rights, because there's a lot of tension. Who's going to get all this stuff? And the older brothers had fallen out of favor. And so there was concerns that the stuff would go to somebody younger. And then Joseph comes along and he's precocious and he's beautiful and he's the apple of his father's eye. And he's a bit of a brat and lords it over everybody. So there's this tension. It's kind of like, you know, like Game of Thrones sort of feeling in that family. And then to make matters worse, at one point, Jacob gives Joseph a garment. Now, in an English Bible, there are often will say it uh, was a coat of many colors or a robe with long sleeves. But in a study Bible, it will often have a note at the bottom that says the exact meaning of the Hebrew word is unclear. The scholars aren't sure what the garment is, which isn't so strange. It's an, Hebrew is an ancient language. We don't know everything about it. So if you're going to try to understand words in Hebrew, you have to say, well, what is the word and where else does it appear in the text? Because that could shed light on it. The word is a short phrase, ketonet pasim. Jacob gave Joseph a ketonet pasim. And if you look in the book of Genesis, it only appears in the story of Joseph, the garment that his father gave him that the brothers tore apart and 
covered in blood. All right, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, has many books, you know, Leviticus and all these other books. Surely Ketonet Passim appears somewhere, but it doesn't, except in one other place in the book of 2 Samuel. It's a story of King David. It's actually King David's daughter, Tamar. And it's a dreadful story of sexual violence and of rape and what happens in a family and a nation when people don't take that crime seriously. In the story, David has a very large blended family. One dad, multiple concubines and wives, and so all these half-brothers and sisters. And um, Tamar is tricked by her half-brother Amnon, who lures her into his rooms, and there he rapes her. And in a sign of mourning, the princess rents her garment. She tears her clothing. And it says in the story that she's wearing a ketonet passim. But then it actually goes on to define it the garment worn by the virgin daughters of the king, a princess dress. Now, I could just imagine a traditional scholar looking at the Genesis account, looking at the Second Samuel account, and concluding the exact meaning of the Hebrew word is unclear. <laughs> then we have no idea. It could mean anything. No, if you have intellectual integrity, you have to admit that one possible interpretation is that Jacob gave his son a female garment. It doesn't have to be the only interpretation or the definitive one, but it needs to be on the table because it's in the text. And if you're going to go with that interpretation for a moment, the story suddenly takes on a whole new light. Because the brothers, who have issues with Joseph, when they see him in public wearing the ketonet passim, they get irrationally violent. And they do violence against him and the garment. Like there was something about it that was transgressive, and there was something punitive in their violence, like, we're going to teach you a lesson. And the violence I see in that story reminds me of violence I hear about all the time today. Violence towards gender nonconforming people, particularly transgender people, especially transgender women of color. Every year there's an event called the Transgender Day of Remembrance. It is not the only day that trans people and their lives are acknowledged, but to me it's the most sacred day of the year. It's the day we gather in November to say the names of all the trans people and gender nonconforming people who were murdered over the past 12 months. And the list every year is always so long, mostly transgender women of color. And the violence they experience is so extreme, so over the top. It's just shocking. And we gather not just to mourn, but to determine yet again afresh that we're going to work to make the conditions different so that this violence stops. And if you've never been to the Transgender Day of Remembrance, you see yourself as an ally towards the LGBT community, I urge you to go. It will change you. And it will mean a lot that you show up. So Joseph, he experiences that level of violence. He survives. He's shipped off to Egypt. And he starts a new life where he is favored by everyone. He's a beautiful man, but even so, he gets into trouble and he lands in prison. And, but even in the all-male prison population, he rises to the top to become second in command of the whole kingdom. And then the brothers come, and he has the power to crush them. And that's kind of what he was taught to do. This is how you respond to, to violence and conflict. Someone hits you, you hit them back harder, but he doesn't. He does something radically different. He tries to teach them a lesson, he forgives them, he brings them together. He becomes like the matriarch of the family. Not that a man can't do that sort of thing, but in the text, in that family, up until that point, that kind of conflict resolution was not modeled. It was unmanly, in a way, to do it. And he expanded what a man could do. And that way, to me, he seems like an extraordinary character. Which brings us to Act 3, climate change, right? I mean, you're, you're with me. This is like you, you were waiting for that. I was like, yes, and that fits perfectly into climate change. Um, well, maybe not, but in my little brain it does. Uh, so it was about four years ago. Are you offended? Could you please stomp out? I love it when they stomp. Do a little stomping for us, though. Like, oh, my gosh, I'm never coming back to this. Oh, my God. Uh, well done. So um, it was about four and a half, five years ago that I began to get concerned about climate change. It was my partner, Glenn, who first was concerned, and then I had what um, Bible scholars call an apocalypse. You've heard the word apocalypse. It's a Greek word, a Koine Greek word, which means revelation, 
we think of the end of the world with apocalypse, but the word actually means revelation, as if a curtain had been pulled back and one sees what's hidden from sight. That vision, it jars you awake. And I had that in regards to climate change. I was going along with my life as a queer Bible scholar, comic, whatever, and then all of a sudden I saw climate change. And what jarred me was I saw that it was a human rights issue, that people were already being affected by climate change. And that really shook me. And the first question that popped into my head was, what is a queer response to climate change? To which my partner Glenn said, you have finally lost your mind. <laughs> what are you talking about? I said, um, there's something about it. He said, you mean queer? You mean like it's weird, it's different? I'm like, well, yes, that and there's something LGBTQ about. I mean, it's somehow, we have something to do with it. It affects us differently, which I have since found out it does. And we have something to offer. So I was so like moved by this apocalypse. My dad, Pete Toscano, um, had died uh, a few months before I had this apocalypse. And he left me a little bit of money, left me and my sisters a little money, and I thought, you know, I need to take this, and I need to invest it in climate. And I took a year off to uh, study climate science and climate communication, because I knew nothing about climate change. I really knew nothing. And so I took this year off to begin to develop. And the question in my head was, what is a queer response to climate change, among others? And I did, began to develop new material. I, um, I started a website called climatestew.com and uh, began a podcast called The Climate Stew Show, which takes a serious look at global warming but doesn't try to scare the snot out of you. And I really learned right away that that's important. Don't terrify, or don't terrify people. Help them. Help them get closer to the story because a lot of people are terrified. And we're going to have a Q&A so I can go into much more detail about what queer responses to climate change are. But um, I have a character, Tony Buffuzio, who does a really great job of kind of bringing the connections in with queer responses to climate change. Um, and he appears in a play I wrote called Does This Apocalypse Make Me Look Fat? It's a comedy about broken bodies, large and small. So I thought Tony can kind of bring us into this queer response to climate change. And I have to warn you, I don't have a lot of control over Tony. Once I begin performing as Tony, it just sort of takes off by itself. It's a strange phenomenon. Um, so, so you ready for a little um, apocalypse? Do I have your consent? Hi everyone, my name is Tony Buffuzio. I'm from the Bronx. How you doing? Good. Yeah, you seem depressed. It's that time of year, right? I mean, in history. Um, no, um, climate change. We're talking about climate change. Have you noticed with climate change, there's been this huge uptick in polar bear imageries. So much polar bears on, I like polar bear porn and not the nice kind either. I mean, these polar bears are, and these photographers are amazing. They take these photographs and they tell whole stories. You see this polar bear on an ice floe. It looks so sad. It looks so forlorn. It like tugs at your heart. Like you want to go over and hug it, right? No, you don't want to hug it. It's going to rip you to shreds. You know, still, it's sad, right? It's the habitat shrinking, and as a result, they can't go off and murder seals like they like to do. So you know what's happening with the polar bears now, and, and they're going on land in Alaska. They go into people's garbage cans. Yeah, raccoons have become, I mean, uh, polar bears have become the raccoons of Alaska. No, they're disgusting. I don't like polar bears, no. They're dangerous and they're gross. No, but here's the problem. With all this attention up in the Arctic, the climate isn't just warming in the Arctic. Yes, it is, and more rapidly, but it's also warming in Central America, where there's this disease, this fungus that's spreading like wildfire, attacking coffee plants. Do we got to worry about that? It's attacking coffee plants. Look at this coffee leaf rust. It's a real thing. Look it up. Now, this is going to sound awful, but I think I could live without polar bears. But a world without coffee? No, that is a dystopian future that I can't face. We got to do something about that. So, you know, I've been talking to my friends. I'm, I, you know, I'm gay, just so you know. Actually, that's not true. I'm bisexual, which doesn't mean I'm confused or I'm greedy. Well, I am greedy, but not because I'm bi. That's another story altogether. <laughs> No, and I've been talking to my LGBTQ friends about like what are possible uh, LGBT responses to climate change. I mean, there's a lot, you know, and uh, we've been talking about it. So, um, now, now, first you've got to promise me, don't freak out, 
okay? Because people freak out when we talk about climate change, right? You need to understand there's still hope, okay? There's still things we can do. People are working on solutions. People in this room are working on solutions, and some of you are going to get involved too. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not surprised about that. We're not dead in the water yet, okay? We haven't gone to hell in a handbasket. I mean, we can be honest. We know the shit's going to hit the fan, okay? But we don't yet know how much shit and how big of a fan we're going to need to deal with it. So lots of questions remain, okay? All right, so worst case scenario, do not freak out. Worst case scenario, we're looking at the potential extinction of the human race. It's not going to happen. We're not going to let that happen. But, you know, that's the... Okay, what people on the planet have faced potential extinctions and exterminations before? Yeah, lots of people, including LGBT people. Back in the 30s, 40s, Adolf Hitler, right? He had a hit list. He was mean. He didn't like anybody, right? You know, he didn't like the Jews. He didn't like people with disabilities. He didn't like Jehovah's Witnesses. He didn't like the homosexuals. I mean, God help the gay Jew for Jehovah in a wheelchair. I mean, public <laughs> enemy number one. He would have really hated that person. And so the, the Nazis, they were mean. They would arrest these gay men, put them in concentration camps. And then they did these sick experiments on them, thinking that they could maybe cure them and make them real men. It was disgusting. It was gross. So those men had to figure out how we're going to survive, how we're going to look after each other, how we're going to evade capture. They had to come up with strategies. You know, and even today, you know, there, there's an epidemic, uh, you know, of violence against LGBTQ people. There are countries in the world, you can't be gay, lesbian, bi, you know, you get in trouble, you get arrested, you can get killed. I mean, Chechnya, there's been horrible things happening. And even here in America, there's an epidemic of violence against trans people of color. No, you know, there is a lot of stuff that we face, so we have to come up with strategies to learn how to look after each other. You know, and a lot of people ask me, like, you know, you're Italian-American, you come from a Catholic family, how are your parents about you being gay? Well, funny story, I came out gay the same day I came out as a vegan. <laughs> and let me just tell you, they're having a harder time with the vegan thing. <laughs> now, I, just the other day, we had a big family dinner. Everyone was there, all my aunts and uncles. And the food's going by. You know, there's a lot of food, right? And it's just passing me by. I'm not taking anything. You know, sausage and peppers, meatballs, stuffed shells. And my Aunt Rose, Rosalie, she says to me, why aren't you eating anything? I'm like, oh, it's because I became a vegan. And she said, what's that? What the hell's a vegan? And before I can say anything, my mom says, it's a pain in the ass. <laughs> so... So if I'm looking at like potential extinctions and exterminations among LGBT people, I'm reminded a lot about the 80s these days. Feels familiar these days. How many of you um, ever heard of a disease called GRID? Raise your hand. Wow. A lot, no one ever knows about GRID. You people. Wow. GRID, the gay-related immune deficiency or gay cancer, or some people called it God's curse against homosexuals. Nice, right? They later renamed it HIV AIDS. This disease. It was bad. At first, in the early days of AIDS, it was, had a 100% fatality rate. If you got AIDS, you were going to die, usually within weeks or months. The government, they refused to do anything about it. The president, Ronald Reagan, he wouldn't even say the words HIV AIDS for his first four years of office. He was an AIDS denier. The public was terrified and hostile and getting more hostile and all the time you had people suffering. In New York City, there was only one hospital that would take in AIDS patients, and that was from the back door. There were funeral homes that would not take victims' bodies. So our ancestors had to act up. They had to get in the face of the government. They had to change public policy. They had to demand action. It's all right. It doesn't bother me. I didn't even notice it. <laughs> Like, did you notice her cell phone going off and that, like, that, that thing in the middle of the model? I didn't even notice it. What was I saying? <laughs> they had to, exactly, they had to change policy. And these were young people, right? They had no experience doing this. They, they didn't have the background in this. And suddenly, they had to face a plague. Any of you ever see the a documentary, How to Survive a Plague? It's amazing. It shows how fierce these young inexperienced activists were, they had to change public perception and how people saw AIDS victims. They did it through storytelling, through music, through ribbons, through quilts. I mean, we're gay, what do you expect? Whatever it takes, right? And they had to look after each other. They had to go and care for people 
in their homes, bring them food, do, get their laundry, do medical intervention, things they didn't know anything about, really. But the most important thing they had to do, they had to break the collective silence because nobody was talking about AIDS. So they had a slogan called silence equals death. And whatever they could, they brought it up. They said, you're going to listen to us. This is a problem. It's real. People are being hurt by it. You're going to listen to us. And, you know, they were amazing. I mean, they got so much done in a short time. They changed literally medical, how, how the medical world works. They changed laws. They saved lives. I mean, yes, there was suffering. But they did amazing things. And I think there's a lot of lessons. If we look at what they did and how they did it, how fierce and creative I think it helped us with the climate thing right now because we got some of the same conditions, right? So the po politics is a lot is the same. There's a lot of parallels. Now, we have to be honest, too. I recognize they made mistakes, too. And we can learn from their mistakes, all right? Because back then, everybody with AIDS suffered, but not equally. Some people suffered more than others. I mean, depending on your race, your class, your access to health care, your strata in society, you suffered more than other people. I mean, yeah, with AIDS, we were all in the same boat together, just not all on the same deck. And that's exactly how climate change works. Climate change affects women globally more than men, which is weird. It affects people of color more than white people, and it affects poor and working class more than rich people, middle class people. So basically, climate change is sexes, races, classes, I mean, stuff that we've been dealing with for a long time, or not, which reminds me, actually, of a Bible story. Sorry, I'm like free association here. How many of you have ever heard of Joseph and the dream coat? You know that story? Raise your hand. <laughs> Very informed audience. I like that. No, um, I have a friend, Peterson. He's a Bible, whatever. And, uh, you know, he says that it's like the, the, it's really a dress, which to me, that's not interesting at all. I mean, that's not the interesting part. The interesting part of the Joseph story, it's a climate story. I mean, that's what's really cool about it because Joseph, he gets sent off to Egypt. I don't even know why he was in Egypt. Anyway, he's in jail, he's in trouble. And all of a sudden, the Pharaoh, the king, he starts having these weird dreams dreams about cows. And Grandma Bufuzio said it's never good when you dream about cows. <laughs> and nobody can interpret his dreams. So they haul Joseph up from prison because he was good at interpreting dreams. So Joseph, he goes before the Pharaoh and he says, Pharaoh, tell me your dream. Well, Pharaoh was having these cow dreams. He said, in my dream, there were these seven beautiful, sleek, fat cows. And they came out of the uh, Nile River. They were followed by seven scary, skinny cows. And the seven scary skinny cows all of a sudden ate up all the beautiful, sleek, fat cows. And Pharaoh said, I woke up in a panic. What does my dream mean? So armed with that data, Joseph predicted climate change, a regional temporary climate change. He says these cows, they represent years, 14 years. See, we're going to experience seven years of plenty. Everything we plant is going to grow. It's going to be amazing for crops, followed by seven years of drought and famine. So he predicts climate change. Then he comes up with an adaptation plan. He says, all right, if this is going to happen, we should prepare for it, right? So he said, so what we should do is during the good years, we should grow as much as possible. And then during the lean years, we got food for the people, you know, which is really nice. It's very thoughtful. And that's exactly what happened. Right? There was all this good growing, and they grow all this stuff, followed by famine and drought. And in fact, that's when Joseph got reunited with his family because they heard there was food in Egypt, and they were struggling. So they came as climate migrants. And for me, you know, my grandparents came from Italy. And you know, back then, they had bad names for immigrants just like they do today. You, I mean, me and Mary heard the, like, the negative turn towards Italian-Americans uh, when they called people WAPs. Have you heard this term before? Well, a lot, of, a lot of people don't know it means without papers. Because a lot of my ancestors came without proper documentation. Same story over and over. But, but, you know, he gets reunited with his family during this climate crisis. And so then the lean years come, he's got food for all the people. And it's beautiful and it's wonderful because he came up with an idea. Now, how many of you are Catholic? We have Catholics in the room. One Catholic, two Catholic, three Catholic. Where are we in the world? I guess it must be like Lutheran or something. <laughs> I, I get a little superstitious about religion. 
I don't like to criticize Bible characters, but I actually got a problem with Joseph's plan. I mean, because it was effective, but it wasn't just. Because in order to get this food from Pharaoh, you had to pay for it, and it wasn't cheap. So the first year of famine, the people came and they paid, and they gave all the money they had in exchange for the food. Then the next year, they're like, we got nothing else, Joseph. And Joseph said, well, Pharaoh will take other forms of payment. So what about livestock? So they gave their livestock. The next year, we got nothing else. What about your land? So they gave Pharaoh the land. And Pharaoh said, you know, you can live on the land, you know, but you've got to give a percentage of everything you own to Pharaoh. Next year, we have nothing else to give you. Oh, yes, you do. You've got your children. How about you give them to Pharaoh to serve Pharaoh as servants, not slaves. That's politically incorrect. And then the next, another year goes by. We, we got nothing else. We're starving. What do you got for us? And Joseph said, well, what about you give your own bodies? so that you become servants in perpetuity to Pharaoh. So Joseph's plan, it was effective, but it wasn't just, because it led to oppression, it led to slavery, it led to Pharaoh being the ultimate 1%. And to me, a queer response to climate change is one that takes into account that solutions can sometimes hurt people, particularly the most marginalized. I mean, you know, why should we go to the trouble, I, you know, to save civilization and everything we care about if we're going to be doing the same damn bullshit that we've been doing to each other for thousands of years? And we got to do better than that. I get very angry. I'm sorry. It's just that I get frustrated. I get frustrated when I see that it seems like no one's doing anything. And to be honest, I get scared. I mean, I'm scared that, like, are we going to be so slow and so dull that we don't actually do anything about it? And lately, it's, I've been having these weird dreams or whatever. I've been hearing these voices in my head. I mean, I don't really hear voices, but I've been hearing these messages in my head. Messages from the future. And you think, well, that can't be good, right? <laughs> what are they going to say to us? I've been getting these messages for us from people in the future, and I he keep hearing them say to us over and over again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for everything you've done for us. Thank you. And I'm thinking, what are we about to do that they're going to say thank you? So, in conclusion, when people ask me, you know, what are queer responses to climate change, I can literally do a whole weekend retreat on that. But one of the queer responses is to talk about climate change without talking about climate change. Because we live in a time where people just get so overwhelmed by this topic. So speaking in metaphors and personal stories and setting up scenarios and then locking climate into place in there, that's really helpful. And using stories, using personal stories. Um, climate communicators more and more are saying people don't need more data. They don't need more information. I mean, you know, obviously people doing the work, the scientists they do, decision makers do, but the average person, they have enough data and information about climate change. They need to hear your story. They need to hear how climate change affects you and other people. They need to see your heart. A, a queer response to climate change, you know, I say that I'm not an environmentalist, and we can talk more about that if you like at some point. I say it in part because as a gay man, I have been forcibly separated from nature. I mean, I grew up in the countryside in upstate New York, and like many gay men, I found refuge in cities. Rural spaces aren't particularly safe spaces for many LGBTQ people and other marginalized people. And so we find refuge in cities, and there's lots of nature in cities, and if you're in the right neighborhoods, there are parks and all that, and that's part of the work that has to be done with environmental justice, having more nature accessible to people, more clean air, more water. But the other thing I think with that too is my desires that I had, I was told over and over, they're unnatural. In fact, they used to describe being gay in the terms of saying it was a sin against nature. And I was told, well, you're not part of that world. And the environmentalist movement, if you ask the average person what is the environment, they'll often say, oh, well, you know, hiking and owls. And they think of, you know, kind of wild wilderness. But environment is wherever you live. 
and most people live in cities and that environment needs to be addressed pollution and all that um, when I first got involved with the climate movement I heard a lot of people saying do it for the children we need to you know save it for the children I'm glad we got some children here very welcome children here but I'm thinking well I'm a gay man I don't have any children I mean yes gay people can get children but it's a lot more challenging for us we don't have mistakes um, <laughs> You have to really plan on that. And so I don't have any personal DNA in the game. And so that talking point, while it's effective for some people, it, it rolls off my back. Not that I don't care about other people's children. But we need to be creative and come up with other th ways to talk about LGBT issues. And that's why I talk about it as an issue that affects justice and rights and pets and coffee and all the things, silly and sublime. But finally, to me, a queer response to climate change is one that can envision success. We live in a world where it's so easy, it's so easy to think of a dystopian future. That doesn't take any imagination. The real imagination is to envision hope and to pursue hope, not utopia. I guess that's another thing that's not worth pursuing, a utopia, but a world that is, that is sustainable, a world that is fair, a world that is stable. And in these times, that's a very queer thing to think about and to do. And I've written, in fact, 50 monologues as a climate historian in the year 2165, who looks back in time and records all the amazing accomplishments of the climate generation, people who lived from around 2014 to 2033, the people who helped bring about the great transition to a whole new way of living that wasn't just about energy, but about community and so many other things. My sister, um, Maria Tos Toscano, now Maria Forlenza, she is really scared about climate change. And she'll, she asked me not too long ago, she said, um, are you scared? I mean, you read about climate change all the time. Are you scared? I mean, should we be scared? And I said, well, you know, there's, very, there's a lot of things that I'm concerned about. There's no question about that. But I said, no. I mean, fear, I'm not, I'm not fueled by fear. It's not sustainable to be living in a state of constant panic and alarm. And that's not how I feel when I look at climate change. In fact, when I think about climate change, I think, what an honor to be the people on the earth right now to be witnesses to this, but also to be part of the solution. I mean, I don't know why we're the people, but I believe we've got the stuff to address this, and it's a big issue. But I feel it's an honor to be able to be the people to take this on and, and to really make the world a better place. And I appreciate you coming out tonight to listen to me. Thank you so much. We have time for questions. I know you all, many of you, if you have to run off and write that paper, I know it's a very special day, 420. Um, <laughs> but I, I have time to take a, a, a few questions if you want. Um, and I also have copies of Transfiguration, so if that was something that you're interested, um, they're for sale for $20, and I take credit cards and Apple Pay, because I do that whole thing. Um, but are there any questions or even comments or reflections, things that came into your head um, during the production? Thank you so much for coming, everybody. Any questions or comments? In the back. I'm, I'm just curious if you could share, like, what's been your craziest response you've sort of gotten to this presentation in, in terms of feedback, either positive or negative, but just sort of what stands out to you in terms of people responding to your delivery? Well, consistently, I've had a lot of people come to me. Usually, at almost every show, uh, I'll have somebody come to me and say, okay, so um, that thing about the coffee, is, is that real? I'm like, really? Of all the things, <laughs> the coffee? But that makes sense, though, because, you know, with an issue this big, we need a foothold. And um, it's hard to imagine polar bears and, you know, collapsing of species. It's hard to envision that. But to suddenly imagine that something in your world that is so expected, so common, 
so taken for granted could suddenly be endangered. That can wake some people up. So that was that was definitely um, one that surprised me. And and I've been very pleased. I've had people walk away who said that they've never ever really seriously thought about climate change as a human rights issue. I and mean, like it was a revelation to them. And they were really grateful for that for that framing. And but but mostly in the past few months in particular, people just have been so grateful um, to hear some a hopeful message. Not one that's offering false promises. I mean, we've got hard work ahead, but we, um, we need hope. My, my partner, he's from South Africa originally, and he was part of the anti-apartheid struggle when he was a college student. And he was in the LGBT liberation movement. And he said when he, you know, he was a member of the ANC, the African National Conference, and uh, he said when they would go to a rally, Mandela was in prison, the government was getting more and more violent. I mean, the two years before Mandela's release, it was vicious. It looked like they were losing so badly. And he said whenever they gave their speeches, people talked about the injustices, they talked about how things were wrong, but they always ended with hope. And someone would say, let me tell you what the new South Africa is going to look like. And they would outline it, they would help people see it and say, that's what we're fighting for. And he said they always ended that way. And I thought it was interesting too that things were toughest right before Mandela was released and there were still hard times after that and there's still issues to deal with for sure in South Africa but um, but change happens like that it seems like things are going nowhere but behind the scenes there are all these people talking I mean all those at that time the government was meeting directly with Mandela preparing his release but you'd never know it from what you saw in the media and on the streets and that gives me hope that there's a lot of stuff happening behind closed doors that I don't know about uh, and there are a lot of people working relentlessly to bring those things about. I just wanted to say here, the way you presented this information was really fantastic. I mean, it was all facts that I have heard before, but the way that you presented it just made a real impression. Thank you. Well, and I think as communicators, the content of what we share has to be good, but we hmm. also should take great care in thinking about how do I want to present this? Who is my audience? What's the best way to reach them? How can I structure what I say in a way that can really reach people? And if it's an important enough message, then taking the extra time to really say, is my presentation working? Having people look at it and all. And then and and I appreciate you saying that because it's an important part of what I do. Questions or comments? I am curious about why you like, could not be an environmentalist. Um, well, in part, again, because of my own experience with the natural world and the environmentalist movement traditionally. I know it's not exclusively, but traditionally has been seen as a, um, a natural movement about wilderness spaces and preserving and conserving wilderness spaces, saving species that are endangered, you know, things that, you know, it, it takes a lot of privilege to go into the wilderness. It takes time, it takes money, um, and like I said, it wasn't always safe for someone who, who is gay. I was sort of pitted against nature. And, and, and it's a very straight world, the environmental world. I have to say, like, I know there are obviously there are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender people who are environmentalists and who are involved in that, but for the most part, most people I meet are straight, middle class, um, and you know, I, it's it's a it's suddenly I feel like I'm coming out again, you know, because I go to these spaces and you know, and and that, and I feel that when we do any work that's valuable, we need to come with our whole selves, and uh, and so that's been funny. I'm going kind of going. I don't experience homophobia, but heterosexism because it is a very heterosexual world. And I think it's because it's just a matter of being in integrity. I mean, I've never been part of an environmentalist group. I've never, you know, had a magazine, read articles about it. I mean, it's just not my jam. It's not how I am. And that's okay. People don't have to be an environmentalist to care about the climate and uh, to get involved. And that's actually really good news because converting somebody to a whole other identity and worldview, that takes a lot of effort. But helping people figure out that they already have skin in the game and, and helping them see that, say, there's something you're passionate about that is threatened by climate change, well, they don't have to become an environmentalist. They can just love their silly pet who's being affected by climate change. I talk about pets a lot, and people are very moved when I talk about how pets are affected by climate change. I'm like, if it gets them engaged, if it helps them better understand information that is hard for them to process, I'm all for it. Yes. I just I have a question. Um, I have a brother who came out like two years ago, um, and he's a Christian, and he has a partner, Larry. And um, 
he's like a faithful Catholic, goes to church every Sunday, which is great, but he won't bring his partner. Yeah. You know? Um, and he still struggles with, and I don't know, because you're a Bible scholar, maybe you'll be able to answer it better. But he said he's very clear in the Bible, like, what they say about homosexuality and all that stuff. So I, I try to look and, like, comfort him and this and that. And, and, and being that you, do you have any advice? Well, you know, there are these five passages in the Bible that are called the clobber passages because they've been used to clobber gay people in particular. And like, so one of them, people always say, well, like Sodom. I mean, everyone knows Sodom and Gomorrah, God condemned the gays. I'm like, well, in Sodom and Gomorrah, the people who came out that night, they were not going to a dance party. They were not inviting the people out to dinner. I mean, they were going to do gang rape. I mean, what they were proposing, those men in that city who, it said all the men in the city, young and old, were wanted to have sex with these strangers, but like force, like what we've heard about these abuses that have happened in Abu Ghraib prison and in prisons in America. This is not about orientation. This is a story about violence. And when Glenn and I, we go out for a night on the town, that's not how we roll. <laughs> so yeah, condemn the people in that story for what happened there. But, um, but don't assume that that's what it's about. And, I mean, and you can do that with all these stories. There's ways you can explain it, but a lot of people, they can't, still can't see it. And that's why in here I decided, let me show you stories of sexual and gender minorities that are really included and are really affirmed and celebrated. There are all these stories about eunuchs in the Bible, for instance, who were not really male or female. They were these other. And um, the first baptism of the early church, the Christian church, Jesus resurrected. You heard about that recently. It happened not too long ago. Um, uh, Jesus is gone, and the disciples have to like, kind of take over to themselves, and Philip is somewhere, and the Spirit of God, says to Philip, speak to that person. That person was a eunuch from Ethiopia sitting on a chariot reading from the prophet Isaiah. And we hear that today and we don't really have a lot of images, you know, but a lot of people don't know eunuchs were castrated men who were castrated before puberty. They never experienced puberty, so they didn't have facial hair or body hair. They had high voices. They didn't have the muscles that come with testosterone. They sounded and looked different than the men and women around them. They were outsiders. I mean, in the Jewish law, in the early, in the early part of the law, they were considered an abomination. And Philip is told, go to talk to this person. And then the person gets baptized and goes away rejoicing. So in the story, you have a black, African, surgically altered, gender variant person of faith. And I ask churches today, if that person walked in the doors of your church, would they go away rejoicing? Because I think that's the message to the church. How did the church already address sexual and gender minorities? And I think that gives people you know, a way, because it's a story that helps people see as opposed to just a law. Uh, that's in Acts chapter 8. You know, at the end of the day, it's about the Bible, right, and the authority of the Bible and, and how people do it. And as a Bible scholar, at the end of the day, I'm not ultimately that concerned about what the Bible meant or what they meant by that. I'm concerned about how we treat each other today. And I don't think people need uh, an ancient text to know how to be respectful and loving towards their neighbor. Shouldn't need permission to do that. Um, but I know it's a long journey because we absorb a lot of negativity, a lot of attacks, and it can turn inward. I mean, look at my story. Um, but when, and also, if you're a person of faith and you're gay, it gets complicated. And that's when you have these intersectional identities. Sometimes you feel obligated to check something at the door. And I just refuse to do that. I'm like, you know, I need to come as my whole self. But it took years. It took therapy. It took a lot of, you know, it took a lot of loving people in my life. I have time for one more question. We got one there, and I'll get you there too. We'll get two. Um, you mentioned these historical accounts from 2100 or something like yeah, that, yeah. from the future. Is this something you've already developed? Yeah. Available? They're all available. I have this uh, website, climatestew.com. Yeah. So I have them on there as part of the podcast, and I also will have links to a SoundCloud account where all the audio is, is there. So you can read them, and I have the whole transcript too, so you can read it as well. So just go to climatestew.com. It's called That Day in Climate History. I'm guessing right now we're already in a room where people take climate change and social justice seriously. Um, how much do you reach out to people who don't already have that on board? Well, the vast majority of people believe that climate change is real. I mean, in fact, there's a Yale study that says up to 40 million Americans are alarmed about it. 
There's about that many who are concerned. Are they engaged? That's another story. And I feel like that's my job. You know, at, at its height, the Tea Party had four million active members. It's not really that many people, but they sure got stuff done. Well, we have 80 million Americans who are alarmed or concerned about climate change. If you can just get a, a small percentage of those people engaged, that's really important. I never address climate denial. I just assume everyone knows that climate change is real um, and that it um, is human caused and that we need to do something about it. I don't do it in part because I see so many climate communicators spend too much energy trying to prove that it exists. And that is energy that your brain could be used doing other things. And I'll see the presentations and they're like, well, first let me show you. And then there's like the first five, ten slides and their precious time they're using to, to convince people of something that is already real. And I, and I asked um, actually um, the woman who wrote the book The Sixth Extinction, uh, Elizabeth Colbert, I asked her, what if ten years ago we had no more climate denial? Like it stopped. Everyone. Everyone in America, no matter what their party believed, climate change was real, it was serious, it was human caused. If that was true, what would we be talking about today? What would we, we be writing about today? And that thought experiment is really important to do because our brains have been hacked by the denial narrative. And the denial narrative, I think, comes in part, there are people who genuinely struggle to accept the reality that climate change is happening because it poses an existential threat and the change is so severe. It reminds me of when my mom was diagnosed with lung cancer. There's some news that is hard to absorb and it takes a while to work through. But there are other people who are intentionally lying about climate change, who are deceiving the public. They are not climate deniers, they are climate liars. And America has a climate denial problem in part because there have been people paid to deceive the public. And that just needs to be called out. But I don't, um, I don't think it makes sense for climate communicators to spend so much time trying to convince climate change is real. The most convincing thing I could say to people that climate change is real is, I took a year off to study climate science. I have to say that probably convinces people more than a bunch of slides if I told them because they sell my reaction to climate change. And I think people recognize those human stories and they're like, wow, he really believes it's real. And I think we need to come up with other ways of, of, um, of addressing this without always reacting to denial. Justice, what can you do? I mean, some people, you know, the best I can do is tell my story and, uh, and see what happens. Um, thank you, everyone who organized this event. Thank you for all the people who came out. Um, if you want to keep chatting, I'll be right here. Thank you. Thank you.